Today's Homeowner with Danny Lifford. Real projects for real homeowners with real solutions. Information and inspiration on improving your home from professional remodeler Danny Lipford. Hello and welcome to the show this week. You know, every day there are more and more electronic devices that are available for the home. Now, they're designed to make life a little easier and a lot more enjoyable. But unfortunately, trying to make all of these devices work together is not such an easy task. Well, that's the concept behind home networking, where you're able to take your information, communication, and entertainment devices in your home, put them together in one system, making them easier to use and a lot more effective. Well, this week, we'll talk with a couple of experts who design and install these systems, and we'll show you what's involved in home networking, how it's installed, and what a difference it can make in your home. Now, stay with us. We're about to get wired. the color really does look good on the screen. Now we're in a showroom down in Florida that specializes in installing and designing home networking systems and with me Blake Yoakum. Blake first of all great looking screen uh, plasma television we're exactly. hearing a lot about those. We've got high definition plate on our plasma TV or thin TV mm -hmm. and this is done in a 16 by 9 format or widescreen not 4 by 3 square like the normal television set. This sets about three and a half inches deep here and it's a 50 inch, it's a larger version of the plasmas that are out there. Kind of expensive though. Little pricey, they go anywhere from about 17, excuse me, seven to $14,000 depending on the size of the television set. Wow, <laughs> I guess that'll come down after a little while after everybody starts uh, buying them, you know, maybe one in every room, right? Just like everything, it'll end up coming down, but right. absolutely. Now, of course, home networking systems are a lot more than just pretty pictures on a screen and a nice sound system. It really goes a lot further than that. Absolutely. What we're trying to do in the houses is wire them for things the customer might want to do down the road or even currently. Um, for instance, we might want to do with our cable and phone system, network that throughout the house so that way we can make a DVD appear on multiple televisions throughout the house or share a cable modem in a house between different computers. Cable modem costs a couple hundred bucks and it's about forty dollars a month or so to have it so if we can share that to several computers the homeowner really benefits with that. And I guess this is really the the brain of the whole system. This is a, a basic hub box or structured wiring panel here and what we've got is our cable coming into it through a cable splitter. We've used an amplifier to boost our cable signal. We have to do that if we're going to split it this many times. As well as we've got our punch down block which is where all our phones are terminated. We're pre-wired for our other computer networking. We've even got a multi-switcher to split our satellite signal. Now from what I've seen, the TVs and monitors around a home that is networked together like this really serves as the informational screen. It's more than just watching a nice movie. Exactly. What we're trying to do with the television sets is not only use them for entertainment, but actually use them as information stations. Okay. Um, over on the touch panel on the wall here, we've got it hooked up to where if we want to watch our satellite via our touch panel here, we can do that. We can go right to our satellite. But I might want to see who's at our front door with our camera or check a different camera in the house, say the back door camera. This is assuming there's video involved. If there's no video involved, we might go to a keypad such as this that we're manipulating the music system of the house or maybe even the lighting system of the house. Okay. We can do the same thing also on their television set or their big screen, wherever it may be, even in the master bedroom of the house. Um, for instance, Right now we're currently watching a DVD, but we could always switch our DVD over to something else, um, possibly even watch something like our camera at the front door if we hear our doorbell ring or maybe we want to check on the kids and check the back door camera. I see. Okay. Now, of course, the, the home theater room like we're, we're set up here for um, is becoming more and more popular, but this one's a little bit different in that it's a rear projection screen, I understand. Yes, sir. What we've done here is instead of hanging the projector on the ceiling or the floor where it's somewhat sightly and you possibly could hear the fan noise, we've done the projector behind the wall, which gives us several advantages, not only hiding the projector and masking the fan noise, but the room lighting is less of a factor. In the closet we've used behind the wall, it's always dark, so the room lighting's not nearly as critical. Um, say, like when you enter a movie theater, the room's pitch black. Right, right. Well, it does look great, and the picture there, again, is good. Now, you've got a kind of an idea of what a home networking system is, is and what it can do. Next, we'll go out on the job and show you all the miles of wires that are involved in that. Hey, not a bad view here, Blake. I believe I can handle this. Me too. 
This is one of the houses that we had wired for what we talked about previously at the store, where we're doing wiring for speakers, keypads, and volume controls throughout the house, as well as full structured wiring of cable, phone, and fiber optic. Let's okay. check it out. All right, great. Danny, in here we've got one of the TV locations, and here we've wired the television set for cable, phone, satellite, DVD modulated throughout the entire house, but we went a step further. We also put some speaker wiring in here so the television sound can be played through the speakers in this area, which is the kitchen, dining area, and breakfast area, so that way it spices things up a little bit just in this area for TV viewing. And probably one of the most common, um, commonly used televisions in the house. Exactly. Now, will all the other components be here, DVD, CD, and all that? We've chosen to take the components and locate them in the media room closet, which is right around the corner in here. Oh, okay, so I see. We're going right over here. Well, this is kind of unique, um, having an actual closet behind all of this. I guess that makes it this nice is, as far as access to that. It's quite a luxury, actually, to have access to the back end of the equipment. And what we've got here in the cabinet is we've got room. We can get to the back end of the television, which is going to go in this cavity. We've got equipment cavities to the right and left. Tape storage down bottom, subwoofer storage down at the bottom right, as well as our three front speakers, and even more storage for media, well, CDs, great. DVDs, anything that you might need in the cabinet. And you've really got to be on the same page with the cabinet man with something like this. Absolutely. In uh, this case, we had some close tolerances we had to work with, which makes the uh, access to the back of the cabinet that more luxurious. But we really want to work close with the cabinet men here um, to make sure the end result, everything works and fits, and there's enough ventilation for the equipment also. I guess also advising on how high the actual screen should be makes a difference. That and the speakers in relation to the screen also. Okay. Well, it looks great. Well, here's more wires. Tell us. Tell us about this. I guess this is where it all really ties in to where you'll have the, the DVD, CD, and so forth. Exactly. What we've got here is we've got all our speaker wiring that is uh, sent throughout the entire house. So the keypad, volume control wiring, and speakers everywhere locate to this area, as well as we've got our satellite and our cable and phone for this entertainment center itself. Okay, now what about where it ties together when it comes into the house? I know commonly the electrical circuits will have a sub-panel. Do you have something similar for all of this menagerie of wires? We've actually got two structured wiring panels that we've got located in the closet right over here. Okay. Danny, we cover up the wires here just so that the uh, sheet rockers and painters won't get a whole lot of paint and such on our wiring. We've numbered our wiring and we want to keep track of what everything is. But up top here, we've got all our cable that'll be used, and when I mean cable, RG6 quad shielded coax cable that's used for cable TV, satellite, and cable modem networking throughout the house. Hmm. Electricians put power in our panel for us for any devices we might use, um, surge protection or cable amplifiers and such. And we've used a second panel here to give us plenty of room to do all our punch down blocks for all our phone wires that are pulled into here, as well as our fiber optic wiring that we've pulled in the house. That's an enormous amount of wire, and it's not typical wire either, I guess. No, what we've done is we've pulled this single structure wire that goes to every TV location in the house. Hmm. And within this wire, we've got two pieces of RG6 quad shielded, so we can do cable television, satellite wiring, or possibly even a high-speed cable uh, to a computer. Mm -hmm. We've also pulled two pieces of Cat5e, Cat5 enhanced, and we've also got a piece of two-way fiber optic. Um, if this is a computer station, you might use a, a, a Cat5 enhanced to get a phone wire there. You might also use the second piece to network back through to a printer located elsewhere in the house. And the fiber optic is pulled to try and make the house a little more future-proof. Um, the fiber optic adds about four zeros to the equation faster than what Cat5 can do. Oh, I see. But, but it's not available in a lot, of the, a lot of the United States. Exactly. They pulled it to neighborhoods, but then they have downstepped it to uh, coax cable to make the houses backward compatible. So mm -hmm. they're doing it to the neighborhoods, but not quite to the houses just yet. I see. Now, in a house like this where you had the opportunity to pre-wire everything before all of the walls went up, a lot cheaper than a retrofit situation, what's the approximate cost if someone wanted just to pre-wire this and maybe add the equipment and the bells and whistles later? Anywhere from uh, fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars for a full pre-wire of uh, including fiber optic wiring. Obviously, it gets a lot more expensive and a little messier if you're doing it after the house is up. Okay. All right. Great. Well, now, um, what will be the next step? I know your guys earlier were um, putting in a few of the panels, they were putting in a few of the speakers, and then I guess one of the next steps will be to come in and start doing a little splicing here. Exactly. They're going to dress up this panel, they're going to do the punch down blocks, the hub for the computer and the firewall, as well as all the 
uh, cable splitters, the multi-switchers that are used for the satellite distribution. And these two panels make it very easy access for not only my service guys to come out and do service calls if necessary, but if the telephone man shows up, the cable man shows up, everything's right here for them, so it's excellent. Okay, well I want to see a situation where it's all put together and it's all working, and that's exactly what we'll do when we come back. We'll go to another job that Blake's company recently completed, and we'll show you how all this goes together. I just love the Spanish style of the home. We're down in Florida taking a look at a home that has a very elaborate custom networking system in it, designed by Stan Zawisha. Stan, show me around this thing. Great, let's take a look. Oh, I can already hear some music in here, Stan. Oh, it sounds great. <laughs> well, now, I know the homeowners just finished the house a couple weeks ago and moved in, and we're in the process of doing all of their decorating, and I understand that you had the luxury of being involved in the design very early in the stage. Oh, it's very, very important to get design stages early where we can get blueprints and we can really custom build the system for the customer themselves. You know, the way I may want it is definitely not going to be the way that they want it. Um, I would build my room around the system where I'm having to put the system around their room. Okay, well speaking of the room, it's a fairly large room, open areas on each side. I'm sure that plays in to the design and exactly how did you approach this? I really don't see a lot of equipment around here. We really have to take into the acoustics of the room as well as the aesthetics of the room and what we can and can't do with the equipment. And I know the homeowners wanted to kind of tuck away the equipment That's a little correct, bit. that's correct. In this installation, we had to start with an armoire here. Uh, this armoire we actually took and had the inside custom built for what we needed. Here we have the 50 inch plasma and we actually concealed all the equipment behind closed doors. Okay, that's, that's great. So you have all of your uh, surround sound, surround equipment, sound equipment, here, equipment whole house audio equipment on this side. Okay, all right. Now one of the first things that I think about is controlling all of these. Usually you have a menagerie of different remote controls. That's right, that's right. For me it'd be easy to understand, but for the customer, got to make things simple. Uh -huh. This particular remote we're using here is basically just like a computer. I actually can design it where I press a button. It's doing all the work right now as we speak for us, and the customer has to press one button, and they have TV. Okay. Takes all the guesswork out of it. That's great. And also, if the telephone rings, then it will interrupt the sound That's here, correct. I understand. That's correct. The great. telephone intercom system will interrupt the speakers that are playing so that they can actually hear it or the doorbell ring. And the remote will work even though the doors are all closed. That's correct. We're using an infrared repeating system, which is basically so that it picks the signal up, puts it behind the doors. We never have to look at the equipment. Okay, now see the speaker there, but... Center a, channel. This is a yeah. six-channel system. Mm -hmm. We have four other speakers in the wall, as well as we've concealed the subwoofer behind the wall here, which actually gives it a really good aesthetic look here. Now that's the big bass sound that that's everybody correct. likes. That's correct. Okay, now as far as controlling the rest of the systems in the home, I know that that probably doesn't do that, and I assume that this is one of the keypads that you use to control. That's correct. To make life easy, the, the remote itself actually controls the TV itself. These keypads control the music throughout the rest of the house, as well as you can look at cameras, you can look at live video, and things of that nature. Here we just press the camera button, here's my front door, and now I can scroll through cameras very, very, very simply here on the keypad itself. Well, a great security feature then. Ex excellent, excellent. Security okay, now is this feature. the only keypad that you have in the house? We actually have three zones in the house. We have five of these keypads, and a sixth one that's actually a tabletop keypad on the nightstand beside the bed, which makes it really nice at night if you want to check any of the cameras, front door, back door, or even operate the system. Oh, that is great. Now, what about um, outside? As far outside as sound. features, we've got outside speakers, speakers in the rest of the house. We've actually also added a lighting feature where as the customer rolls into the garage at night, they push a button and it turns on all the lights in the house. Well, that's great. It makes it simple for the customer that's and it's great to come into a house that's already lit at night. <laughs> well, this is some great equipment, great house, and I can tell you like your job. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> Well, I guess you can see there's a lot to know about networking your home. But once it's all in place, it's really a lot of fun and very easy to use. I'm Danny Lipford, and we'll see you next week here on Today's Homeowner. Get ready to review your fix-it list as Danny and home repair expert Joe Truini show you this week's simple solution. Well, Joe, looks like some more toilet repair. Yeah, it look, looks that way, Danny, but actually the toilet itself is fine. The problem I'm having is with the lid that sits on the tank. And this is actually a pretty common problem in that the lid itself doesn't fit that well. It's a little wobbly, and because it's wobbling, you get that grinding sound. I've seen that a lot, and that sure is an aggravating sound. It is. It's like nails on a blackboard. It's right. because you have 
just a bare china surface scratching against another bare china surface. So what I've done to, what I'm going to do to fix that problem is just put a bead of silicone, clear silicone, around the top of the tank so it'll act as a gasket. Okay. So we just start on one end, just put a bead right along. You don't need that much either, maybe an eighth inch diameter. And then right across the front. Now, I assume you'll let this dry probably, what, overnight? Yeah, at least overnight, because you want to make sure it's good and cured. You obviously, you don't want to put the lid back on it and glue it in place. You're just trying to create a, a rubber gasket. Well, Joe, let's see if your little trick works. Okay, let's take a look. It's been 24 hours. The silicone's nice and fully cured. Let's just set this on top. There you go, look at that. Not a sound out of it and no wobbling at all. Well, that silicone really worked great. And you know, there's a lot of ways you can use silicone in your bathroom, but I'll bet you never thought about this one. Now let's join Danny at the Home Center to check out the best new products. Now painting is probably the most common task around the home that homeowners take on themselves. But if you've ever been in a situation where you really had a real problem area, whether it's inside or outside the home, you know how important it is to prepare the surface properly and to apply primer. Now we've seen situations where paint jobs had blistering and alligatoring and chalky surfaces. All of that can be addressed with proper preparation and a real good primer. And I know just the primer to use. It's a Zinser Peel Stop Primer. It's actually clear and one gallon that cost about $25 will cover about 400 square feet. Now the thing about this that's a little unique is that it allows the paint to breathe so that if you have some moisture trapped behind the, the primer, it'll allow that moisture to escape because trapped moisture is the number one problem that causes paint failure. Also, if you have that chalky surface on the outside of your house, it'll bind that so that your paint will stick. And if you're sanding or have scraped an area, it'll seal down all of the old paint edges again so that your paint job lasts a lot longer and really looks a lot better. The same with any alligator in your checked area. It fills in those grooves and really will make a big difference. Now you still need to do all of the proper preparation work, but this step with Peel Stop will certainly help your paint job last a lot longer. Now let's go outside for Around the Yard with Danny and lawn and garden expert Barbara Katz. You know, everybody just craves a beautiful lawn, but I think we know by now that it takes some time, and time is just something we don't seem to have that much of. So what are you suggesting, uh, hiring a lawn service? Well, you, you can do that. There are just a couple things that you can do yourself. They're not that time consuming, but they're gonna help you get to that point where the lawn is gorgeous. And the first one is to get an aerator. Now I've seen those being used with a big round drum, the motor, but it seems like it damages the yard more than it would help. I know, Danny, it looks like it's tearing up the whole place. And what it is gonna do is leave these little plugs of soil, which just kind of look a bit messy on the lawn, but it's actually created holes throughout the whole area where air and water and nutrients, fertilizer, can get right down to the roots of the grass. That's got to be the perfect time to add fertilizer to your yard. Oh, it's incredible. You can't imagine how strong the grass gets from that. And then you can also sort of top dress with fertilizer in the fall. But if you want to do something a little bit more organic, you can also cut your grass so that you leave some of the clippings on top, and that will break down and feed the lawn. So I guess that's where the mulching mowers you hear so much about really come in handy. That's exactly right. They, they take the cutting and put it into little tiny pieces, and it's not ugly, and it's pure nitrogen, so it feeds the lawn beautifully. And you know, the last thing that you can do is in the summer, if you just let your grass grow longer, two to three inches, that is so much better for a lawn in the middle of the summer. And just cut the top third off, and that is going to reduce the time you spend mowing and make for a stronger, more beautiful lawn. 